So I've learned over these last couple of years, just kind of being in the space and, you know, just paying attention that just because you're a big influencer on the music side and, and you're a big cannabis advocate, that doesn't necessarily translate immediately, at least, to uh, a successful brand in cannabis. This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, John Monopoly and M1 of Urban Aroma. Gentlemen, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? Good, man. How are you doing? How are you guys doing? Doing well. Excited to dive in with you guys. And just for the record, uh, your locations, please. Uh, this is John Monopoly, and I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, this is Matsul Olubala, broadcasting live from the planet Earth via Miami, Florida. I love it, Kellen. I think we're going to have a one and a half for the East Coast. What do you think about that one? Yeah, I think it's a nice split. You know, East Coast, West Coast, both five. And- yeah, we're going to have a nice conversation there. So, so gentlemen, for our listeners who are unfamiliar with you, can you give a little background about you guys and kind of what led you to the cannabis space? John, do you want to go first? Sure, sure, sure. My name is John Monopoly. I'm from the south side of Chicago. I've been in the entertainment industry for 30 plus years. I started when I was very young as a promoter, promoting hip hop parties and hip hop concerts throughout the city. Uh, And then I went on to uh, manage a bunch of different acts. You know, I was on managing Buster Rhymes for a while. I uh, was on Missy Elliott's management team for a while. I managed Mob Deep for a short period. I managed Carl Thomas from Bad Boy. I'm mostly known for managing and discovering Kanye West. I met him in 1991 and we became very close friends and ended up doing a bunch of business together. And, um, you know, I I helped him launch his record label and do do a bunch of things. And uh, yeah, I've I've been blessed to be in the industry and be, you know, somewhat successful for, for a long time. And I am a... Uh, consumer of cannabis. Uh, it helps me with my anxiety and stress and um, something that's very close to me and dear to me. So when I got the opportunity to work with M and the uh, Urban Aroma crew, I met M1 actually through Kanye a couple of years ago and we became friends. So when I got the opportunity, I just jumped at it. I love the platform. I love what we're, I love what we're about. And uh, I'm, I'm here to add value however I can. I um... I'm known to most of the world as M1, one half of the Tell It Like It Is. Everything is political rap duo dead press that function uh, as messengers in the hip hop space. Definitely like a reality music, um, speaking to exactly to where people are and like uh, really reflecting a certain kind of truth and speaking truth to power um, is kind of like my secret power. Um, and so the uh, intersection of cannabis and culture um, has been evident to me since the beginning. One of my favorite messengers, Peter Tosh, who came with the message to legalize it at a time where, to me, it, you know, he threw that yard marker so far ahead of where we are right now that I, I knew it, it was going to be the place for the future to catch up and for us to be. And um, I came to this space mainly because I saw that what is happening in cannabis is phenomenal, as phenomenal as changing people's ideas about human rights or, you know, about healthcare or, or the way we, uh, you know, educate our youth. Um, these, it's a pivotal question in our life around health and wellness in that way. And um, again, as I started to, you know, meet like-minded people um, in these spaces, um, one of the most interesting people who I saw who understood who uh, the, the, the uh, acute differences in what cannabis about um, was John Monopoly. Again, like I said, working, um, you know, Kanye's political campaign and with him in other creative ways, let me uh, see how um, John Monopoly gets down and that um, he was already had, you know, uh, a foot planted in the cannabis space. And I felt that he would be great with our team, with Urban Aroma. So that's how we started collaborating. So I'd love to learn a little bit about Urban Aroma and kind of the value that brings this space. Is it for the traditional operators or for the retail market? Tell us like what the platform currently is and then where we, we see it going in the future. Okay, so Urban Aroma is a uh, cannabis directory um, at its base, if I had to just say, start about where it is. Um, but it's definitely 
that has branches and is a seed planted to grow in many directions. So um, it is a, a, a destination where cannabis meets culture, meets activism, and can grow into those places. Not only can you, you know, uh, if through our SEO uh, and, and um, in the East Coast and gray market areas, put in where to find weed um, anywhere up and down the East Coast and urban aroma will will be the place that you will direct you toward, you know, the finest purveyors, um, you know, of boutique and quality cannabis that um, have, you know, the type of ethical standard that, you know, we have been used to from the West Coast for so long. But also along with bringing you um, where to find that, we're also going to explain the philosophy of why, why weed ain't legal in D.C. yet, you know, why there's a statehood issue, what's going on in New York and what Mayor Eric Adams says about it or what the you know operation of cannabis management OCM is saying uh, we're going to bring you culture and a way to activate um, your uh, and empower your mission to free the plant I think ultimately to free the plant so that's kind of what urban aroma does and will do what was uh, what was the inception for urban aroma how did you guys come up with the idea urban aroma came uh, after working with some of my comrades for a long time I come from a, a revolutionary background obviously so you know, we saw this space as one that was inundated with an upside downness of kind of people who were interested in exploiting the plant and who also the, the people who had done, you know, who had paid the most price and were sitting in prison for the plant weren't benefiting from it at all, meaning black and brown people. So the inception of Urban Aroma came in balancing that space and wanting that to change. Um, so, you know, we wanted to put the, the, the controller in the hand of the so-called minority or black and brown user or legacy operator. It's to expose what the legacy work has been for all of these years that kept the cannabis alive, that kept weed and marijuana popular in a time when it was very unpopular and where we were prosecuted and persecuted for it. You know, um, you know that is the inception of why Urban Aroma happened in the first place. And what more better voice to empower what urban aroma means than the voices that come out of the urban music, the hip hop community, R&B. Um, you know, we are, you know, we take it way back to, you know, Duke Ellington and, and, uh, and Dizzy Gillespie blowing, blowing on Jays. That is our truth. You know what I mean? Jazz was invented out of this paradigm. So um, that, that's what Urban Aroma is about. It's about putting like, the, the voice back with the voiceless in, in that space and getting up some sort of reckoning. That's, that's why it was conceived. And just to piggyback off of what M was saying, it's, it's a real travesty that uh, black and brown people re represent less than 4% of the overall market as far as uh, being able to uh, operate in the cannabis space in this country. Uh, the way that we've been persecuted and locked up and are still locked up for something that now looks like it's going to be federally legal in the very near future. We're here to shed light on, you know, the operators that look like us and just to support the movement in general. Even before his time goes on, because he, 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 again, he, um, which is a, a great reason why we're here, he can touch base with, you know, a lot of the community that feels the same way we do. So, you know, we've worked with people who are, you know, pushing the, 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 the line on policy and legislation um, and organizations who we collaborate with and work with, like Mission Green, you know, Weldon Angelos and, and those, those kind of people who are the ilk and, uh, of, and that character to directly, directly put money on the books for people who have been locked up for cannabis and uh, I think that that really matters, like to be able to say, you know, this is, you know, this money or this, our efforts will directly benefit going to books so people can eat or write letters or make action for the people that John was just talking about, um, you know, have been leaned on. And it's a travesty, travesty that we don't have that voice. So um, we're not only are we talking to talk, but that's the walk that we're, we are walking. How does like something like that happen? It's conversations with political parties. Is it, is it larger outreach? Is it awareness? Take us through that conversation. You know, how, how does something like that, you know, take it from where it is and continue forward so that the people who have been, you know, wrongfully locked up can get those, those benefits like you were saying? I think it comes from awareness and education because a lot of people don't even know. They have no idea that Corvain Cooper got life. 
for 40 tons of wheat, just wheat. They have no idea that Dante Westmoreland got all this time and organized his own campaign to free himself in the Trump, during the Trump campaign. I think that the, the education is really communication. One of the best uh, channels to communicate these kind of political messages and everything is, is music. And so like cannabis and music have kind of been intertwined from a cultural perspective for a really long time. And, and John, you want to kind of touch on how much cannabis has influenced the music industry? Oh, wow. So I remember the Chronic album. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, you want to talk about influence, right? Right. I remember when it was still kind of cool to be a smoker and then Dre dropped Chronic and everybody was smoking immediately. Like within three weeks of that record explos- exploding, everybody was smoking. And it seems like it's been, I've been smoking ever since. There's such a, there's such a, a big intersection there between cannabis culture and hip hop culture. You know, since the beginning of hip hop, almost, I, I would say that cannabis has played a part and, um, you know, it's definitely played a part in my life since I was very young. So is it an important part in the creative process as well in the music making, or is it more of someone that just enjoyed on the side, you know, take us behind the scenes on how, how it's used from a music sense. I know when we're recording records, you know, whether the artist that I'm working with at the time is a smoker or not, it's always around. It's a part of the creative process. It's a part of the overall process, whether we're listening to music, whether we're shooting visuals, whether we're creating, it's always around. And um, especially being, you know, in, in L.A., where like most of the artists come to record and create with it being such a big part of the California culture, it, it's, it's everywhere. I want to say like what's so crazy is when The Chronic came out, we did not know what Chronic was, you know. And I think, you know, we in New York, we were smoking, you know, B.C., you know, B, British Columbia, or, or, or shit with the orange hairs on it. We were smoking Arizona. We were smoking things that did not necessarily, that were not as green or open. But um, I just want to say in the creative process, you know, even if you don't, you're not a smoker of cannabis as a creator, as an artist, like Manap said, it's in the room. And to me, it becomes a great translator. You know what I mean? So that, you know, we, we ride, you know, the elevation that comes from the high and the THC and, and you know, CBD and, and terpenes and all that's present in the plant, that is almost like a plug, a communication with the brains of the people. And that's, I think, how to go, you know, a part that, ca- that cannabis has played in, in what we're doing, especially in hip hop music. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. Um, so part of it. Are there certain strains and creative products that certain artists lean on? For example, does Kanye West have a preferred product or does a certain artist look for a certain product to kind of help them in an album in certain challenges? Or is it more just like the flower is the flower and this is the one I appreciate? Like how, how specific is the, the creative aspect with the, the artisanal craft? Jay doesn't smoke like that. We've smoked together a couple of times, you know, but he doesn't have a particular strain because he doesn't, he's not a smoker, but yeah, I think there are preferred strains and I, I don't think it's one that I could name necessarily. You know, I know that Allen Iverson Viola is like a preferred strain. Of course, anything in the cookies universe is, is super hot right now. Yeah. And definitely what young LB is doing with your jokes up and runs. I think between those three families, you get kind of like most of the preferred hottest strains today. Would you say that's accurate, M? Or who am I missing? I mean, look, right now, like, for instance, you know, Mario, Mario Bruce Mo. Say, say again? I said I forgot to say gumbo is a preferred strain right now. Yeah. I mean, like I said, Sh- Shabinsky made gelato. Right. Yeah, that's just everywhere. It was like having a hit fucking record. You know what I mean? It was like when Lil Wayne made a Millie, like it's in every studio. You feel what I'm saying? Like yeah. it was like so. It's amazing to see the especially geneticists such as like Mario Stravinsky come forward and affect our culture. You know what I mean? Like he hangs around with all the young producers. You know, um, you know, and, and I'll be in rooms where he he is just as much a celebrity in his studio making music as the artist is. You know what I mean? So, you know, so you you can, um, 
you know, of course, you know, young LB and Runt. Um, I think he said that already. And and um, for me, like, I remember a time coming up where, it, you know, Kush was what it was. It was, you know, Master Kush and OG Kush. We, Kush had developed and was, you know, permeating the East Coast. And almost all good weed was called Kush at that point. I'm going to take it back to that, that point. So if you wasn't smoking Kush in the studio, we probably couldn't get down. You know what I mean? Like, and, you know, they, before that, you know, you had you had that, that uptown piff. The piff was amazing. Um, yeah. and we right. and that was that was always in the studio. If you ain't had Piff, then your studio wasn't lit. I promise but you. Piff, but Piff was more of a New York specific thing, right? It, like it, 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 exactly. Fun just like outside of New York like that. Yeah, nah, it wasn't. It was New York. And just like New York Sour Diesel. You know what yep. I mean? That's that's strange itself. Stuff. You know what I'm saying? And um, so you know, you the, it's, you know, I I just it like it, it's regional. Obviously, you know what I'm saying? It's reasonable. But that that to me, and I'm an indica <clears throat> smoker. I can't smoke sativa and create shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm an indica. I know people, some people need that up, but I need to feel it heavy in order for me to tap into that vital place. You know what I mean? But yeah, anyway, I, you know. I will say the, the West Coast came up with a lot of good it's strains, not- but one of my favorite strains is New York Sour Diesel and Stout. So let's talk about the influencer partnership. Obviously, with with music and cannabis being so linked together, one of the challenges we've heard in the industry is that uh, bigger names are attaching themselves to strains and and creating brands in order to kind of push their likeness, but are, are really detached from the actual product and the plant. Do you see that as a challenge? Is that something that you've seen in your circle? Can you kind of take us through your opinions there? John, you want to go first? Sure. Um I've seen, you know, and I don't want to say any names, but I've seen very influential, huge artists that are cannabis friendly and cannabis promoters, two in particular. And again, I I just prefer not to name names because I don't want them to think I'm kind of discrediting their efforts, but I'm, I'm, I'm watching them struggle. You know what I mean? It's like when you look at a guy like a burner or a young LB who are like huge stars in cannabis and some of our counterparts from the music side that are much bigger stars than them, right? That have millions and millions of followers and platinum records and world tours, but they can't figure out how to get the same traction in the cannabis space as they do in the music and lifestyle space. And it's, it's really challenging. Um, because there's just certain nuances that people buy into and certain things that they just don't as, as cannabis consumers and it's just being a part of the culture. So I've learned over these last couple of years of just kind of being in the space and, you know, just paying attention that just because you're a big influencer on the music side and, and you're a big cannabis advocate, that doesn't necessarily translate immediately at least to... Uh, a successful brand in cannabis. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just tricky. It's just tricky. I want to pick piggyback on what Monopoly said, and I love it because you got a great mind in John Monopoly examining this. And that is, you know, if anything, if he, anybody knows what's, what tricky is, meaning like delivering to a consumer a product than then John does, which he's done successfully um, in culture, in many ways, you know, it manifested in so many ways, whether it be albums or, or clothes or anything that comes through the mind of the artist. So, you know, I got to say that it's this, you know what I mean? Like when I see a brand and I see that uh, who is attached to, I, I have to know deeply that this artist understands the, the plant the way I do. And it's, this is a very intimate way. It's cool that if you just smoke, that's cool. You know, but I'm talking about see it as medicine. And it doesn't mean you got to, like, smoke a lot like me or roll big joints or anything. It just means that you have that intimate relationship with the plant. And I think that shows. I think people can tell. I think people know burning smoke is big and good. That's the reason why they can trust that brand. You know what I mean? So if you don't see other brands taking off, it's almost because we haven't seen the intimate relationship you may have had with that plant. I know people have seen mine. That's for sure. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wrote so many songs about what it's like to, you know, be in that journey and go through that journey. And people kind of can can even come up to me with my favorite shit and be like, I know this is your favorite shit because we talked about that. 
You know what I mean? But I think, you know, there if, if where you have that intimate disassociation with culture, I think that that is going to play a major part in brands that are associated with artists taking off. You know what I mean? The more you let us in, the more we're like, oh, I sm- okay, I understand. Well, we're the same. You know what I mean? And, you know, like John Monopoly got, you know, you know, uh, you know, the strain for, for bipolarity for, you know, and people are going to say, oh, shit. I'm fucking with, with Monop shit, like, because I'm on that too. I'll be on that side of time too. You know what I mean? So, I, and I see, uh, that's how I, I see Monopoly. We got together because I could see, oh, this man smokes for a reason. It's, it's a part of his DNA. And that, you know, that to me, you know, that's, that speaks volumes. I think that's so important because on the on the internet side for Twitter, there's always this push back and forth on when the big celebrity or musician attaches themselves to a brand. And then there's the the purchasing manager who says he'd never buy this because it doesn't really sell so well. And I think one of the things that excites me with the announcement of, of John becoming an Urban Aroma is the ability to kind of pair those creativity together and develop that trust exactly like you were saying, and so that it, it's deeper than just that initial push. And I can only imagine, you know, the, the challenge of getting in and then kind of solidifying yourself with, you know, the everyday consumer who sees a name and, and is not sure, but then trust in that and then the values delivered upon moving forward. So are the hottest trends and strains, do they start in the dispensary or in the legacy outlets or underground? Can I, can I talk on this, M? Oh, please. Underground first, legacy second, then in stores. Everything starts in the streets. Everything. Same way with a record. Your first spins ain't going to be a radio. Your first spins is in the club. Your first spins is in the strip club. It starts in the streets. Very, very similar to the cannabis space. You got guys, and, and again, uh, I'm not going. I don't want to incriminate anybody, but you got guys that are making huge amounts of money in the cannabis space now be, because of the simple fact that they laid a foundation in the black market. Now they can do stuff above ground because they're so hot that they, that they move in real weight, you know, where they need to. But all that, all that starts on the ground. Would you say? Would you say, Emma, I'm off? I uh, one hundred percent right, uh, and I and to, to me, uh, uh, underground was, uh, or the streets is synonymous with legacy. You know what I mean? Uh, they're, they're, that that is synonymous to me, and uh, because you know we're the ones who again are going to smoke it in the room without anybody watching it, really taste and say, is this really what it is? Is this is this what that is, is that is this that that? You know what I mean? That's in that's in the conversations of the rooms of the people, and we it's not about anything except for how does this taste? How does that feel? Ooh, uh, you know, and that is where we develop, you know, that word of mouth. You know, we're going to pass it along. Like like John said, it's going to be in the strip club. Yeah, you know, I mean, your place is going to be lit simply if it smells like, you know what I mean? If you smelling like that runs, then yeah, you probably, I probably want to come in your spot. You know what I mean? And, and do what I do. So, you know, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think the dispensaries, this leads to the higher question that corporate or dispensaries in that market and the legal market has to really take leadership from, le- from the legacy market. If it happens the other way around, people are going to balk that and the balk the industry and have no, have distrust and, and you know, what they say that they provide and go to the legacy market, which is the reason why I'm, the competitive legacy marketing like California is the way that it is. Why, you know, most people would rather be legacy 80% and only 20% of the people in cannabis are participating in legally, you know. So let's let's do it right. You know, let's listen to the streets first. Let's listen to the legacy first and, and build and build from there. That's my two cents. And I mean, I think a lot of the strongest brands come from from that whole avenue, right? I mean, we were talking about Burner and Jungle Boys, like they didn't cut their teeth in the in the legal market, right? They didn't learn the skills they yeah. They know right. now, right? That creates yeah. that tremendous products that they put out there. That's all they, from the streets they, and legal uh, legacies. And now they got two of the biggest brands, and it all started underground for the people you're talking about. Yes, sir. And, and to piggyback what my knob said, like like Jay Z came from crack, <clears throat> and, admittedly, and when and when he became president of Def Jam, he said that marketing strategy was me. So you know. Literally, you get you could get a bunch of eggheads who graduated and read a bunch of books and went to college about marketing and, and urban, blah, 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 blah. but 
it, it, ha- it has to come from it, that real experience. How do we get the people who are underground now to feel comfortable with coming out and, and operating in a legal market with, let's say, the rules and regulations of getting the products tested? So how do we get that, that balance to get them to feel comfortable to take that steps forward into, into more of the prominent light? I mean, you know, the first step, obviously, is to have a trusting relationship with the legal market that says, we won't be prosecuted for the things that we did in the past while this wasn't this market wasn't legal. Meaning browbeaten by law, saying we weren't are gonna be in a position to get the first licenses or looked at in some sort of side way. I mean, come like and I, the term is 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 amnesty. It's full amnesty. And I think if you're not starting with amnesty, you're not gonna be able to build the trust in the legacy market and let people come forward and say, look, you know, I've amassed this empire from cannabis this long. You know, um, you know, I'm gonna come take, you know, my empire and said money and wealth and resources and put it in your banks and we can we, let's do this all legal and tax it and let's make it all work. The only way that's all gonna work out is if we have an established communication and framework with structure and policy that um, holds amnesty as, you know, a way that we can come forward from the true legacy operator, which I think is only going to be defined by the legacy operator ourselves. You know what I mean? It's not going to be defined by the state of, or for federal. And with that being said and sanctioned and legitimized in this way, go through the process of saying, look, we're going to come forward and we want to offer all that we have. But more than what we want, want to do is not be penalized for what we've done in the past. And that's how we can start. That's a, the place to start. That's so powerful. So what is one thing you learned in the music industry that applies to the cannabis industry? I learned very young how to market and launch an artist just from hustling, you know, working at different labels and management companies and working with different artists, I kind of learned the ins and outs of how to brand and and how to promote and how to launch a brand. And it's this very similar uh, process in the cannabis space. You know, you, you got to build a brand, you got to push it. You have to make sure that it's hot in the streets first you know, before it crosses over. So there's a lot of parallels in that space. And uh, that's that. That's what I learned. Em, you want to speak to it? I mean, there's, you know, I don't want to speak to the brilliance of John Monopoly. I, I, the, I, who am I to even say anything? Um, I, he, he laid it out. I think you might have gave up a little bit more jewelry than you should have gave him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I can say this. Um, as a touring artist for 20 something years, traveled the world some more times than I would care to admit. Um, the most important thing to do is connect with people. It is that people feel you and understand the presence and importance of what's between us, you know, and culture and music you know, it's a song that means something sometimes, even if it means just get fucked up or have a good time or free ourselves. It means something to us. And cannabis can be in that space. So, like, you know, I think, like, what I've learned is, like, building that community, building that real community. That They can't take that from us. I don't care how much, many laws you write. I don't how, care how many times you go to the Capitol steps. People are going to act in a manner that makes sense for us. And if, if we're a community, if we're united on it, then we can make the definition. You know, it's like literally all power to the people in, in the form of cannabis. You know what I'm saying? Um, so that's what, I, that's what I take from, from like, you know, the music industry, um, especially hip hop, which is like really follows no rules and, and really sets its own trends as, and, and is empowered by a, our a community that is in many ways outcasted. You know what I mean? Like our opinion matters nowhere else except culture, you know, we and and um even in places where we should naturally be leading, you know, like sports and and, and entertainment and, and and more, you know. Um the, you know, I think we can change that relationship here. And um so that's that's what I that's what I learned from from music and and that. But I just really gotta say I'm thankful to be able to uh, you know, see the leadership of 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 um, Manat because yeah. That, that says it all. And that's the future, I think. 
What's one way the cannabis plant has shocked you? I'll say it shocked me when I was young, when I first started getting kind of comfortable with cannabis in high school. I was shocked at when I started to learn how to use it right, how much it actually relaxed me. Like, I didn't know what the actual effects were. I just knew at a young age that I liked the smell and it seemed like something that I should fuck with at a very young age. But I didn't know it was going to, you know, completely cool me out as it has for 30 years. So what what about you, Em? I would say this, you know, it's definitely the same. Like the revolutionary thing that it did to my mind and the the freeness of it allowing me to be be me. I mean, I think that thing is uh, done wonders. I think psychedelics can do that. I don't, and I don't think it's just unique to cannabis. I, you know, it can be it can be present in, in in psilocybin. But the breakthrough definitely came for me in cannabis, and I feel the same kind of relationship with it as uh, as Monop- um, as John Monopoly. But I would like to also say that recently, like in a most like kind of hippie way, like I would find my way to like. Eureka and, and and other places in California, you know, Seattle and Portland, where you know, like it was like, man, you know, the regarding of what the plant is happens on another spiritual level. So then you have like development of like a lifestyle. So it's like him and like other ways to process this, you know, this thing into something more powerful than just something that we smoke. I mean, we could really make full like industry around it. And I I saw fabric and textiles begin to be born from it. And now it's like talking to people like Isaiah Thomas, like he's producing so much hemp um, and, and that he's creating, you know, uh, you know, mechanisms and and parts that uh, are durable enough to replace, um, you know, bolts, steel bolts and nuts in cars. That's pretty shocking to me. I think that just what, and what's more shocking is the fact that I know this, so I know the government knows this, but chooses not to move on something that can be so advantageous for them. You know, that's that's fucking shot. You know what I mean? So that's what I was saying. <laughs> probably money motivated, unfortunately, right? Like, I, I think at the end of the day, the government uh, is influenced probably by previous decisions, and some of them may not be the best decisions for the collective and the environment, and they they choose to do that. But you're right, 100%. And I, I think it's perfectly said with the unlocking that cannabis can do. And I think that's really the most exciting part for the masses. And I think here on the East Coast, who you know, haven't had a chance to get as much exposure to the plan as as they might like, just given the the current framework. I think the unlocking is really coming. So let's talk about the summer series. I'm excited to learn about that. You know, the the pairing, you know, take us, take us through that. You know, what can we expect and and, and shed a little light on, on what that's going to be like? Sure. Uh, Urban Aroma Summer Series, uh, the events take place at Legacy New York, which is located at 98 Orchard Street on the Lower East Side. Uh, we had our first event with the Young LB, from uh, Jokes Up and Runs. Uh, it was a big success. And then we we just had Mike Epps uh, last week. And we have a lot of really exciting artists uh, that we're working with to come do drops and come do meet and greets. And we'll, we'll be announcing our calendar uh, very soon. And yeah, it, it's been great, you know, and I'm really excited to, to, to you know, tell you who, who all we have confirmed, which is kind of, at the end stages of locking everybody in. But within the next week or so, you'll be seeing some announcements online with an actual schedule with the uh, actual uh, uh, artists that are affiliated. But so far we've done, like I said, Young LB and Mike Epps, and they were were both good turnouts. I just want to tag on and say I just left New York City. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. The summertime in New York is an awesome time to be outside. The summertime of 2022 is crazy because cannabis is emerging and there's so many, so many dispensaries out everywhere. It's like fucking crazy. It's popping up like mushrooms. And which is great because we want to build community. And so the idea of the summer sessions, like Monopoly said, is to engage in a community that can we can keep the energy moving around the lower east side where we found it. So like little enclave, our spot, our gallery there and our dispensary really works for like just being able to bring people in and we and then we have a, a spot in a, a nice downstairs where we, you know, just do multimedia and, and have the ability to do, you know, 
everything cannabis. You know what I'm saying? Um, like you said, like L- LB's party was crazy. Mike Epps came and burnt it down. Stupid, but like, you know, we, we, we are hosting other cannabis brands and other partners that are nearby and, and, and community that we all want to come in and partake together. So that's kind of what the summer, the summer series is about. And we're the best at doing it, especially with the that we fuck with. So. It has a focus on giving back, which I think is so important. And I'd love for you guys to kind of shed on that, that it's not about just the event and the plan and the, the collaboration of music together, but also the association of helping others and giving back. Can you, can you shed a little light on that? I want to say that what people are going to get used to is that when you visit certain places that are cannabis friendly or progressive, that because you do that, you chip in on something that's from a higher purpose. You know what I mean? Like uh, we work with the ASAP Foundation. Um, ASAP ha- is foundation has developed these fentanyl kits. Um, you know, anybody who knows ASAP Yams or who, who knows, you know, further, any one of those dudes know that they are advocates of like, you know, we can prevent like not knowing what we're ingesting it or even identifying the things that might be harmful to us before they get into our bodies. And so, you know, you'll find a... a that the, the, the testing kit um, there, right there on our ca- uh, on our counter in, in Legacy. Um, you know, we are associating again with brands like Mission Green and Weldon Angelos, where we literally dollar for dollar will match people and putting down on the books of, you know, uh, cannabis, incarcerated cannabis people, you know, men and women, um, who many of them we've begun to, to free and start working on freeing, but um, more than anything, we just need to let people know that they're there. So, you know, I mean, we've, we've given, you know, 30, tens and thousands of dollars in this campaign already. And, um, and we'll continue to do that. And our brand, People Army Farms, my brand um, that comes that was born out of dead press, is literally about when you uh, purchase our gummies, our CMOS gummies or our, you know, People Army flower bags, you give to political prisoners and you give to, you know, um, you know, urban black campaigns that support, you know, against police brutality and the rest of that type of stuff. So um, I just, you know, that again is the ethos of what Urban Aroma is about. Before we do predictions, we ask all of our guests, if you could sum up your experience in a main takeaway or lesson learned to pass on to the next generation, what would it be? Em, you want to go first? Nope, Manap, I want you to go first. <laughs> I got to think about that. <laughs> to a generation. <laughs> you said, sum up, what was it again? Sum up your experience in a main takeaway or lesson learned to pass onto the next generation. What would it be? It can be life-related advice. Work harder every day. Be relentless. And no matter how many doors get closed in your face, never give up. I'm going to start where Manab left off, which is beautiful, because when you said that, like, the only thing I could think of, the first thing that came to my head was never give up. I can testify that right now, these are some crazy times in America, in the world. You know what I mean? And it's not going to make sense the way it's being told. We're going to have to see it from an alternative point of view. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced that the lens is going to have to change and the tellers of the stories are going to be different. And we're seeing it all come to pass. Shit, the criminal weed is now a superhero savior for our community. You know, um, I never thought I'd see some of these days. Um, You know, it can look bleak. It can look like there is not worth it. You know, I've been there. You know what I mean? Um, And But more than anything, if you don't give up and you can keep the idea that you have in your head that, that hope is there, we will likely succeed. Just don't give up. And um, that's what I will pass to the next generation. Well said. Well, All right. Prediction time. It's 2027. What type of events, releases, or activities are happening in New York to make it the biggest cannab- cannabis market in the world? You know what's being released? Licensed. They're giving licenses out. They're releasing that in New York. And guess what? It's not being done fairly. They're not considering legacy. They're giving licenses out and about to roll out the second uh, set of licenses. I think they're car licenses. And and I just think that social equity doesn't do it. So 
you know, what we're seeing along with every all the new dispensaries that that's happening in New York, which makes it an amazing place to be. Should have you seen Washington Square Park lately? If you don't know what I'm talking about, then Google it. And I just think that if we're gonna play this thing fair, you gotta consider the legacy operator so we can be out there and we can be popping and make you know this as hot as the summer in New York is. So I'm I'm gonna turn your question that way. <laughs> I like it. That. That's right. I think by 2027, you're going to see retail in every borough just popping everywhere. Hopefully, black and brown people will be represented in that group. I think you're going to see whatever version of Web3, um, there are going to be some NFT or Web3 activations that I can't think of how it would work now because I'm not so familiar with this space, but... I know it's the next frontier. And by then, it should be a new version of that probably coming out. And there'll be activations in the digital space. But again, more so than anything, I just hope that Black and brown people are represented when retail blows up in New York. Because by then, it'll definitely be popular. I I want to add on to that prediction as well. I think New York is going to scale to be the largest kind of boutique operation like a producer, my prediction is you'll be able to get, we're going to catch up as far as cultivation and understanding how to scale, make our grow of the plant so unique. There's so many unique tastes in New York and the hit, combined with the rich history of New York, like 2027 is going to look crazy with what is going to be available as far as like plant, plant medicine and the rest of it. I think it's going to be better than Amsterdam, Morocco, Barcelona, California, any of that shit ever was. It's going to be the green giant. <laughs> I agree. I think one thing that's going to push that too is going to be consumption lounges. I think sure. New York is going to be huge on consumption lounges, especially with the amount of um, get-togethers that, I mean, everyone loves to just hang out and that whole community aspect associated with with New York, which is what I think everyone really loves about New York is that community aspect and just getting together. And I think that uh, consumption lounges and the ability to smoke and consume together is going to really separate New York from other states. Brian, what do you think? I, I think a little bit of the intersection of both. And I think John kind of touched on it before, but like a, a, a hidden underground album release party that's pushing a brand or a strain, I think is where like the, the streets can kind of take it to the next level, right? That exclusivity that builds like the massive hype. I think that's what makes New York kind of special. They have these like small enclaves where like there's small social circles where unless you know about it, you don't know about it. And it exists here in New York now. And I can only imagine with the intersection of music and cannabis continuing to growing with the leadership of both of you gentlemen at the helm. I'm excited for New York. And I think that's going to help take us to the new level. And I think that's what's going to separate us from California. I think California is not as closely tied into some of those hidden things that I'm at least envisioning in my head. Maybe it does exist and I just have no idea, but I'm excited for that opportunity. Me too. Well said. So gentlemen, for our listeners, they want to get in touch. They want to learn more about Urban Aroma in the summer series. Where where can they reach you? Uh, You can hit me on Instagram at at John Monopoly, J-O-H-N Monopoly, just like the board game, M-O-N-O-P-O-L-Y. You can always reach me out, obviously, at One Dead Press RBG, but more than than that, just go to Urban Aroma underscore, at Urban Aroma underscore. We're building our social media. We, uh, you know, we've had, because of, you already know what happens with cannabis um, online. So, Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we're developing you know, ways to really communicate who we are and what we are. But if you hear this, then go to urban aroma underscore or even just urban and uh, just check out what we have, who we service um, and, and the communities in DC and New York um, that we can blend together and turn into like, you know, it's magic. You know what I mean? So that's where to find us. We'll link it all up in the show notes. Thanks for taking the time, gentlemen. This was fun. Thanks guys. Thank you. of our DNA is identical. It's a 0.1% that truly makes us different and unique. And that's what the show is about. Find out that 0.1% about your favorite guests. Find out what music they like, 
their first cannabis experience, and even what their room looked like growing up. But more importantly, or as important, their journey. Learn what makes them unique on Everything is Personal.